Okay, Tim. So, you know, we are performance health podcast. So I really want to talk to you today about what is health? The thought with health is it's the absence of disease, right? That's the general accepted term or terminology for health. And what does that actually really mean in terms of day to day? We're, we're not walking around like, gee whiz, I hope I'm not sick or right. I'm not walking around thinking, I hope I'm not injured in some way, which are the two kind of vectors that would say you're not healthy, you're sick or injured. And it's the absence of those things that defines being healthy. But the problem is, is it's kind of vague and it's kind of not really associated with that. Like health has a different connotation, meaning that like you see someone who doesn't have disease, you know, technically, or doesn't have any injuries technically, but is overweight or lethargic or not very confident. There's the mental, emotional health. There's the spiritual health. There's the physical health. There's the, the dynamic associated with athletes and health, right? The, the athlete playing hurt, are they really unhealthy? You know, there's a lot of like open for interpretation with something like health, but from the, the broadest, most simplistic way to define it, it's the absence of disease or injury, but we really need to unpack what that actually really, what, what that means, right? The, the, the premise is one thing, but the actual understanding and application is another, which I think is going to be important to kind of dissect and break down here. Like health is, I think... An, understood but not or appreciated but not really understood and i think that's something that we need to get further along here all right so let's unpack it then like the absence of disease like, what should we be keying in on to make sure that we are truly absent of disease we are truly healthy what gets measured gets managed the top of the list of you can be ignorant or negligent to your health right the i don't know don't ask don't tell that that is being ignorant Right. The, I don't have to, I don't have to know something unless the, I don't have to deal with it unless I know about it. So that element of just completely being naive to anything that may be wrong, that would be a big part of this. Then the other part is like negligence. I know I'm just not going to do anything about it. Right. The, and we see this a lot with lifestyle related disease. The, I'm pre diabetic, but, you know, like I'm not really full blown diabetic. Not diabetic like, yet. Yeah. And is that, does that mean you're healthy? Right. No, it absolutely doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right. That just means you're on the precipice of being unhealthy, but you're not there yet. You're on the, you're, you're towing the line, which for all accounts, and this is something that's important. I had this conversation actually just recently with one of our, our members at the gym was this idea of what is a marker to determine diabetic versus pre-diabetic versus not diabetic and that like HA1C level and or HBA1C and that percentage point, the goalpost has been kicked out further and further based off of the, the statistical average, right? The norm is now moving to what we would classify 10, 20, 30 years ago as unhealthy as to now not healthy, but not as unhealthy as the statistical outliers. Mm -hmm. Right, the people of the seven of HB1AC are now diabetic, but before it was five. And you know, and, and for the folks that don't know what HB1AC is, it's this long term look at your insulin levels, right? And this idea of looking at glycated proteins and the impact of having high circulating levels of insulin from spikes in blood glucose chronically, from overeating carbohydrates, from being sedentary to using sugar as fuel constantly and then overeating that as a resource based off of thinking that we're tired or lethargic and then we start pumping insulin because insulin's job is to shuttle glucose into the cell and if we have an abundance of blood glucose from eating food or not utilizing that energy efficiently then insulin will pump that into the cell and that will drop your blood sugar and people usually respond by eating more mm -hmm. right that blood sugar roller coaster so to speak and since we have such a high chronic level of insulin from overeating and not exercising enough, now it's, it's materialized into people having this perception that they're healthy based off of now everyone is more unhealthy than they've ever been. 
and then HbA1c level has been moved higher and higher and higher, not because we know more or we're like, oh, well, maybe that 4.5 marker wasn't as bad as it we thought it was. That's not why that number is moving up is because we look at the ranges are based off statistical average of a westernized society like America. And instead of, instead of saying that 4.5 is there, everyone's norm is higher. Mm -hmm. And that outlier or that moving of the ceiling upwards has created this perspective of a false notion of health. Right. And when I talk about the negligence effect, you know, as a practitioner, someone who started looking at blood panels 20 years ago, when I started answering the field, that perception of like, now that was unhealthy then is now healthy now, or by the definition of absence of disease, like it, that's the, the problem here. And if I don't say anything, if I just kind of tolerate the, well, it's in range kind of, but that range was not that range 10, 20 years ago. I'm being negligent in that, right? And it could be a hard conversation of like, we have to stop overeating. We got to start exercising, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is this like weird place we're in health that we've moved chronically into this state of perpetual disease and and not really getting good results from the, the modern medicine and healthcare and overall exercise and the recommendations. And it's pretty confusing that's where the health problem really comes from out. And I think that's why we need to have these conversations, right? And right. I, we target a lot of strength coaches and we talk about it with a lot of athletes and their their statistical variance for unhealthy and injury is a lot more obvious because they're kind of the pinnacles of health and vitality. The people that can do the most impressive things athletically in the world when they're injured, it's pretty noticeable and recognizable. But how many runners do you know that run around with stress fractures and and all these other ailments like tendinopathies or strains? They're unhealthy. Yeah, well, and a lot of them also are probably running around with higher HbA1c levels too, because you know you think runner, they just think I need carbs, 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 because I'm always running. So I wanted to go back to like the ignorance negligence conversations. Like let's hopefully assume, right? If you're listening to this podcast, you want to be more informed. So we're hoping that you're not necessarily going to be negligent. So you want to be more informed. What specifically should we be targeting? Like my HbA1c, you mentioned five as a metric. Like what should we be targeting with our HbA1c fasting glucose or, or any other metrics that you think are relevant to just that general health standpoint? When, when this person who cares goes to see their doctors, what do they need to ask for? What do they need to look for? Because clearly the doctors, you know, I'm not saying they're part of the problem, but they're not necessarily part of the solution right now as the statistical statistics get further and further pushed to the right there. So what do we need to be looking for? I think even a simpler, more attainable thing is mm -hmm. blood pressure, resting heart rate. Yeah. That that's that's easy. That that's you easy. Yourself. Yes. And if that's out of range, like if your blood pressure is 130 over 80 or 90 and above, you are high blood pressure, right? And that from a classic sense is at risk for cardiovascular disease at risk for metabolic syndrome, resting heart rate above 70, you know, that the lowest your heart rate should be in the more when you wake up in the morning, you are in a heightened state of arousal, or you are a elevated heart rate. And you, you think about the, the fractal relationship, the, or the folks that are maybe just listening to this first time, like we talk about a lot of these things, but fractals are a big part of it. Simple rules repeated. So if I have a high heart rate, now I look at what does that manifest out into, like my heart rate's elevated throughout the day. And for a simple concept to understand is we probably have a finite amount of heartbeats and you're, you're taking from that over and over when you have a chronically elevated heart rate. The other part is from a blood pressure standpoint and why that's such a significant thing. And I'm saying those two things because those are extremely accessible. Mm -hmm. I mean, extremely. Like there is probably no reason why anyone who would ever listen to this podcast cannot have access to a knowing their heart rate or knowing what their blood pressure is. Go you to any blood store store. right now. Yeah. You have one yeah. for like 30 bucks. Yeah. You, you could just, they have them there for you, right? They oh, have yeah. the automated ones right there. You can put your arm in. They'll give you live feedback on what your blood mm -hmm. pressure is. So if you're at, if you're at a pharmacy or a 
grocery store of any capacity and you go over to that, that pharmaceutical area, they will have a blood pressure test that you can do right there. And you could do that, what you just described, of buying a, heart, a blood pressure cuff for 30 bucks that's automatic and test that periodically. But if you want to know, like, how do I become less ignorant to my health and how do I become more aware of what is healthy, start off with what is your blood pressure and what's your heart rate? Because those are the those are the biggest things that are going to manifest over time to compromise states of health. And it's so easy to get, and there's no reason not to. And I think sometimes, too, we can poo-poo at the idea of, like, well, I'm getting it from my doctor. How, how valuable could that be? Right. Well, their job is to react and respond to when health is compromised. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to zero in on where that, that problem emerged from from the symptoms that are presented and they're going to know that blood pressure and heart rate is compromised probably when they're doing the test, why they're doing the test, but they need to confirm that. Well, you can confirm your progression to being unhealthy, or I guess in this case, a regression to being unhealthy uh -huh. by just testing and being aware of it. And if you have elevated heart rate above 70, when you're waking up in the morning, if you have elevated blood pressure of this 130, I would say even 125 over 85 and above, anything above that, the bigger the number, both diastolic and systolically, that's a problem. Your body's overly pressurized, that you have to work harder to, to deliver blood and remove blood from the peripheral of your body. That's a lot of impact systemically over time. Mm -hmm. So let's say I wake up tomorrow, I'm, I check my blood pressure, resting heart rate, I'm I'm 135 over 95. My resting heart rate's in the mid 70s. Like, what do I do? What's the next step there? Like, I, I care. I, this matters to me. So, what do I need to start doing? You got to start looking about what you do repeatedly and how it got there. And okay. We're going to do a couple things repeatedly. We're going to sleep. We're going to eat, and we're going to move. Yep. And the there's a lot of people out there who exercise a lot, who move a lot, and they are still in this what I would perceive as on the rate to becoming unhealthy, right? I know a lot of folks that exercise quite a bit who have high resting heart rates and high blood pressure. And that in itself becomes this, this paradox, right? You are doing something that's going to be positive. That's manifested into you being in this like pre unhealthy state. Mm -hmm. I can totally see that being confusing. And then you could be dismissive of that metric, right? You were told you need to exercise and your blood pressure is elevated and your resting heart rate's elevated. So therefore those metrics can't be right because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Problem is you might not be doing the right exercise and you might be doing exercise that's not congruent with what you're, you need. It, mm -hmm. it might be what you like, right? If I am just constantly doing these activities that I've already either inherently good at or I like to do, but it's not anywhere near to what I, near what, to what I need to do, then that's a huge issue. and. Again, there is a, a notion with high performance, if I'm your strength coach and I'm working with elite level athlete, has the potential to make millions and millions of dollars from playing a sport. And it comes down to how fast you are or how robust you are in these very specific qualities, like generating force or rate of force. The thought of how cardiovascular fitness and general health fits into that is minimized. And that has a top down, a trickle down effect to what people perceive as healthy. And there's a very like anecdotal association with the best players in the world do strength training and sprint training and all these other things. And I think on the back end, we're getting a message coming up from behind of people who are more long term practitioners to health and vitality coming back and saying, hey, we need to focus more on cardiovascular fitness. And the pendulum, I believe, is swinging. The only thing I'm concerned on is swinging too far. Too far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, it, we're just constantly just back and forth of like 25 years ago, there was a, we have to fight the good fight of getting people in the weight room and preventing Wolf's Law, which is the gradual degeneration of, of tissues, bone tissue, muscle tissue, connective tissue, and applying stress to that tissue. So it responds by calcifying and growing and being stronger and longer and being able to do more things. Your health span expands. 
But now we got this massive pendulum swing into everyone going to the weight room, getting after it, which is amazing milestone considering where we were 25 years ago. Good luck convincing anyone that needs to improve their health to lift the weight. And I, I see that as a huge swing that way, which is a huge thing. Like, it's a, I don't want to minimize that. And then we're dealing with the long-term things that people are just only strength training. And then it swings back the other way with like, no, you should be doing long, slow distance cardiovascular work. Zone two all day. Yeah. And it's like, all right, we got to get somewhere in the middle here. And we got to right. use better testing and proxies to say, that's good until it's not. The one premise of hormesis, uh, the the idea of understanding medic or response to medicine, is the difference between the antidote and the poison, usually amount and frequency. Mm-hmm. And same thing with training and variables of training. Like strength training is really good. It's a really effective thing until it's not. Yeah, yep. cardiovascular fitness is a really good thing until it's not. Like everything will have a point of diminishing returns if we do it long enough and frequent enough or as enough intensity. And it has to be balanced. And what you do is look at your blood pressure, your heart rate, your body comp, your body mass. We didn't talk about that, but those are a big part of this as well. Like we like people will downplay the significance of body mass index or BMI and its relation to health. But the truth is is bigger people have a lot more energy expenditure to keep their systems operating, right? Smaller people live longer. We know that. Like centarians are usually smaller, eat less food, do less things. They don't need as much energy to consume. Because every time you break down energy, it's heat. It's expressed in the form of heat. And that comes at a cost metabolically, right? Digestive system, the endocrine system, the overall muscular system everything has to work to burn that system and when we look at the concept of strength training and exercise that is inducing a need for more energy in based off the energy expended and the energy required to recover from that and all of that has a like a very symbiotic relationship but the point is is I look at my blood pressure, my resting heart rate, my BMI, and I say, okay, like my body mass index is big for my height. My blood pressure is high for my age and my resting heart rate is high for my age. Risk is going up and health is going to be compromised. I've been strength training, been eating more protein. Okay. Well, still in a negative health perspective, Mm -hmm. like keep strength training, adding cardiovascular at work. Or, hey, man, like, have we ever talked about sleep, diet, nutrition, lifestyle, managing stress? Like, no, not really. I just added strength training, and it hasn't netted me much in terms of these big markers of blood pressure, resting heart rate, body mass, body count. I want to get back to, you know, sleep, stress, how, how we manage that. But there's, there's something else I wanted to hit on real quick. You mentioned, you know, we're measuring our cardiovascular fitness. Like the idea is just to move more. One thing I've seen a lot right now is, oh, you just need 10K steps. That's it. Just get your 10,000 steps. Don't worry about anything else. Like you're good to go. Strength train, 10,000 steps. What is that? Is that enough? What do you think? So I think it's something and it's a, it's a number, right? It's the beautiful thing about 10,000 steps. It's a number for people to to strive for, right? A good Mm -hmm. versus bad day. What we'll find is there's going to be a plateau effect. So let's say that we have a, everyone's listening to podcasts and they get a 10% bump through the wearables that we have out there, Apple Watch, Aura Whoop, et cetera, in people getting more steps in a given day in a 24-hour period. And that's a great thing, right? Like, that's an awesome thing to look at. Like, people are getting up and going. Yep. The problem would be is when that hits the plateauing effect, right? If we take this group, right? And there's always funny, like, research to go through, like, because the, the notes are always a hysterical part of it. So taking someone who's got a BMI above 30 and then having them do 10,000 steps with the predominant, those are, every research has not been out there for a very long time. Maybe we start to do that fasted and then they're eating less calories. Or maybe we're doing that on a caloric restricted diet. Or maybe we're doing that with a macronutrient restricted diet like carbohydrates. And the net benefit is amazing, right? So the response to that is, okay, we got to get, we got to, we got to walk more. We got to get everybody hitting this number of 10,000 steps based on this research article that we saw. And then the after, right? We followed up with our subjects. They all gained the weight back. Or we followed up with our subjects and they plateaued and dropped off because they weren't seeing any change after a certain period of time. 
it's the you got the 10,000 steps daily for three months. That's a great milestone. And it's a great milestone for a lot of people. But what's the second order there? What's the follow through, right? If we're not progressing, we start to lose interest. And yep. progression is going to come in the form of a couple things. It's going to be longer. It's going to be more intense. It's going to be the combination of longer and more intense, right? right. So does that parlay into going for a run? Does that parlay into doing more high intensity interval? Work? Does that parlay into doing things that are more competitive? Right, you start to enter yourself into five Ks and ten Ks, and that will be the part that I think is going to be the most interesting thing here. It's what is the what is the follow up here? The just arbitrarily saying ten thousand steps because the other issue, and we don't talk a lot about this, is how sustainable is that? You know, mm -hmm. how long does it take to get ten thousand steps in a given day? Depending right. for most people walking ten thousand steps, that's a really slow for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking like minutes; we're talking hours. And the one thing that we know is that time is very, very finite. And if we don't have more time to give, what is the response to that? And this is part why high intensity interval research came to be. Like the whole premise of Tabata, which got the same thing. The pendulum just swung way too far and people became overly acidic and burnt out and broke down because they just did that. They tapped the well too often. High intensity interval work became problematic. But it was a response to Long slow distance research saying if you just run, you know, five times a week and do 30 to 60 minutes each time, and that evolved into, well, I got to do more. So I end up doing 70 to 90, and then I got to do more. And then it goes to, if you're not doing a, pretty much 50 miles a week, you don't care. Mm -hmm. Like everything has to move up to the right. So someone came back and said, can I get the same VO2 max adaptations? If you're not familiar with VO2 max, it's how efficient we really are as a as a unit, but the ability to deliver and utilize and remove or deliver and utilize oxygen and remove CO2 is VO2 max. And when we look at that as a construct of why what 70 to 90 minutes of cardiovascular exercise gets us every single day, backing up to, can I get that in a fraction of the time? So if I do 20 on 10 off for four rounds with a three minute break in between and do that again, and I get the same level of VO2 max adaptations as doing 90 minutes at a 60% intensity every day. Well, that's really good, right? From a time, yeah. time economy standpoint, mm -hmm. but what happens when they start to do that every day, they start yep. to get patella tendinopathies from being on a bike and doing 20 on 10 off. They start to get elevated blood pressure and resting heart rate because they're doing extremely acidic stuff. They're constantly tapping in this glycolytic energy system and not giving themselves enough time to recover. And that becomes the issue. It's the what after, right? Mm -hmm. And my point is, when we start to think about the, the idea and the, the, the good behind 10,000 steps, like, let's just, like, let's start off with saying that's, it's a really it's a really good thing when you break it down. People are going to be more mindful. They're going to walk more. They're going to be more conscious of getting exercise daily. That's going to be really good for a large sample, right? There's a lot of people in America who are overweight, who are poor body comp, who are high blood pressure, high resting heart rate, and they're going to now be encouraged and empowered to do 10,000 steps. Mm -hmm. And I think that's phenomenal. Then there's like a, a, another end of the spectrum where 10,000 steps is nothing. It's just more time and it's just going to deplete them of natural resource form at a higher level. And then there's a, the median there, the most of the people in America that I'm kind of overweight, kind of unhealthy or moving on the way to being unhealthy. The exercise is good, but it's time. It's a time thing for me. And that part as a whole is the area that we really need to be most conscious of because mm -hmm. there's a second order of huge drop off, plateauing, and then just maybe gaining everything back from either not having the time or the, the, the motivation to commit to that. And right. we need to be prepared for that as health practitioners, right? Like I, I got to pick up the pieces from this massive influx of people walking, right? And one of the things that we often forget is a lot of this response to exercise has been orthopedic, physical therapy, nutritionist, and like th these things have evolved and grown to a level that is pretty impressive. But what are their reaction to? It's people exercising in a way that's become counterproductive. And a large part of physical therapy is people treating people who've gotten hurt exercising. And that's a wild notion if you think about it.
like this thing that was intended for good has become now bad. And we have to have a, a second order management system of physical therapy and treatment to handle that. And the point of that, what you asked originally of, I hear a lot of things about 10,000 steps, that might be a great number for someone, but if it's going from 500 to 10,000, that might lead to orthopedic issues. If it's going from someone who's doing a high level strength conditioning performance oriented program, it might not be in anything for that person mm -hmm. other than just a waste of time. Yeah. And hopefully it encourages people to move more, exercise more, be more aware, stop being ignorant to your comp your declining health. And then to the other end of the spectrum, the person that's really high performing going, all right, there is a point of diminishing returns to training six days a week, twice a day, every day. Like you, you have to find some sort of middle ground. And yeah. the hope is going to be net positive, not constantly reaching a, a point that no one can sustain or do without getting hurt or compromising their health. It goes back to that original idea of hormesis, right? The dose, the dose is going to make the poison. And, you know, what we see with the PT realm and everything you just mentioned is that's a response to too much of that dose. I wanted to ask you if you could unpack acidity and why that matters. You mentioned getting over acidic and why, why that's relevant, relevant and maybe unpack the glycolytic energy system and how that relates to that acidity uh, and why that matters. So we, bioenergetics is a study of how we create and utilize energy. Right? And it's all forming into this, this simple single unit, andesin, andesin triphosphate or ATP. And ATP is coming from glucose or sugar. And we eat food. We're what we call open systems, meaning we need to bring in energy from the outside world. So we eat food that gives us energy. And we break down, digest that food, and then that circulates in the form of glucose in the body. And that glucose enters a cell, and that cell becomes ATP in a, in a couple different ways one being glycolysis, and the other one, being more aerobic, which would enter the mitochondria and then form more ATP. The difference is the presence of oxygen. And if I can get enough oxygen to the cell and I'm going at enough intensity to allow for me to deliver oxygen and, and utilize that oxygen in a cellular level, then I go through the mitochondria and I go through oxidative pathways. Problem is, is when I don't have enough oxygen, and we are maybe going at an intensity that's too hard to sustain, we bypass the mitochondria and we go through this glycolytic pathway. The glycolytic pathway is expensive. It's a really expensive process that we're going to create ATP, hopefully in a more rapid manner than, than or uh, hopefully in a way that we can do what we're asked to do, but it's going to have a lot of byproducts. And those byproducts are acidity. And that's a look comes in the form of hydrogen ions in a cell. It comes in the form of calcium ions in terms of muscle, muscular contractions and neurotransmitter transport or action potentials. Uh, sodium, potassium in terms of action potentials. It's it just a lot of things moving in and out of the cell to procure this ATP. And that acidity builds up and that leads into potentially producing lactate, which goes into lactic acid. And I, I know a lot of our listeners will be familiar with that. And that lactate is basically the body's response to not having enough oxygen present. And it's not a bad thing because we each can use lactate as energy to go through the liver in this process called the Cori cycle and re-enter the cell before more ATP, just long and it's expensive. And the issue of being acidic, we're just having to rely too much on a very expensive process to create energy. And the notion of having a lower resting heart rate, a lower blood pressure, means that we're better at transporting, delivering, and utilizing oxygen so we can increase efficiency and decrease these metabolic byproducts that are metabolically expensive and kind of catabolic, meaning they break down tissue, like acidities over time, bad. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not all bad. You know, it's one of the foundational pieces for hormone response from growth hormone and testosterone that we can recover from workouts. So we need enough and we need to be able to utilize that. And this is why we need to have a, a more balanced approach to training. And if you're listening to this going, I didn't know I was going to get into a physiology lecture. You just need to think about this from the context of if your resting heart rate is really high, that means you're probably going to be acidic quicker. 
You're going to produce more lactate faster because you don't have the luxury of delivering oxygen because your heart rate is probably the best proxy to look at intensity. If your blood pressure is really high, you have extremely limited blood going through an overly pressurized system delivering oxygen. So those are two really important things to promote efficiency. And one of the nice things about long, slow distance and doing 10,000 steps is that your heart rate doesn't get that elevated and you improve the function of your heart and you depressurize. The problem is we don't have a lot of time to do that. And if I can get you there quickly by leveraging more specific protocols that understand the power of LSD or long, slow, long, slow distance and the power of more glycolytic anaerobic workouts, we should be able to get to you where you want in the most efficient linear path without as much cost in terms of time or potential stress on the body. So a city builds up, our resting heart rate's high. It's a pretty good sign that we need a little more of that car- true cardiovascular work, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's the, the answer, right? So if your resting heart rate's high, you got to figure out ways to get it lower. And the, the thing that you think about with that heart, the reason why that heart elevates because it, or the heart rate elevates because it wants to deliver more blood because we're not getting enough oxygen to the system. So it pumps faster and pumps more blood outward to hopefully compensate for the lack of oxygen entering a cell. Now, thinking about it at the other end of the spectrum, if I have a very slow heart rate, we pump less, but we pump more oxygen per blood or per molecule of blood or per liter of blood that we're sending out. More efficient. Yeah. And that, that process is like, okay, you're really inefficient. You're overly acidic. You have a elevated resting heart rate. Okay. Well, how do we get you to produce, to get more oxygen out to the peripheral per beat? We need to decrease the intensity and go slower. And that process is inescapable. Uh, and we're probably organically moving into less efficient heart over time, just in ge- organically from being older and Things tend to become less efficient. You know, you look at an engine or a car, the more miles on it, the less efficient it is. Same thing with your heart, right? It's just we, the natural byproducts of aging are, are inevitable. And we slow down the rate of aging by becoming more cardiovascular fit. And then we also can slow down the rate of aging. Bigger body masses are going to have to beat, have a heart rate that's beating more. So yeah. if I can get body weight down, if I can improve your resting heart rate from being more cardiovascular fit, you're probably going to get a overall slower decline in terms of health just from simply those two things and increasing your blood pressure is the natural byproduct of having a lower resting heart rate and a lower body mass all right so if you know in what is health the absence of disease sort of sort of put a bow on it here and and what does that mean what are some markers we can look at at home we don't necessarily have to outsource blood pressure resting heart rate so if we can get those under control we're going to be in a really good shape that's it man that's it nailed it all right, thanks. And we didn't get to you know sleep, psychological health, and all that, but those might be episodes in and of themselves because I know that we could go deep on those topics too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I hope the absence of not talking about anything doesn't mean it's not important. It just means right. it's a it's a lot to unpack. So mm-hmm. in due time, stick with us. We'll get you there because we'll, uh, we'll get there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's the part that's how what's your bandwidth here you know like, yeah. so well, it's, you it's, to strap it's, in for a whole hour and listen to us unpack this or what i you know i i'm betting no so thank you all for listening to this and hearing me rant about what is health here or lack thereof yeah it was, it was good I, I i learned a lot so hopefully our listeners do too awesome all right Corey. All right, thanks tim